Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Glad to see this good number out with us this beautiful Lord's Day morning. Um, so, um, by way of announcements, we have quite a few here. Rhonda's sister is having surgery tomorrow, and she'll be traveling out of town to take care of her. So, we want to keep uh, Rhonda in our prayers for safe travels. And, um, and her sister and her family in our prayers and I uh, hope that uh, everything goes well and she recovers quickly. So let's pray for the doctors and the caregivers as well. Uh, Janice Martin's husband is now recovering at home. Uh, however, the doctors say he may have some permanent damage. <coughs> Excuse me. So if we want to keep um, that family in our prayers. Christina Robinson has surgery Sunday afternoon and is now home doing better. So that's good. Uh, Rhonda's brother in law is recovering from gallbladder surgery. Chris Wyden, this is Janice and Carolyn's sister in law, uh, needs prayers as she is dealing with some masses on her lungs. And Lisa Melrose is battling cancer again. Uh, Diana Wagner went to Cleveland Thursday for a consultation about her kidney cancer, and she may need some type of surgery. Uh, please keep the 14-year-old grandson of Larry and Yvonne the Shears uh, in your prayers and, and that family uh, as he is uh, recovering from second and third degree burns. Uh, please keep Nancy Van Meter in your prayers. She is... Uh, Still going through cancer treatments is, and is very weak. And Greg Comforter is in Florida for the winter and he hurt his big toe and had to have surgery and remove part of the toe. So let's keep him in our prayers for, for healing. And I tell you, I mean, there's everybody is different and every cancer is different. Um, but I learned a whole bunch when he died with his uh, ordeal and, and I myself uh, had cancer. And, and then uh, recover from that. So I would love to talk to any of these people if they uh, want to consider thinking outside of the box and trying some different things. There's no magic pill, there's no guarantee, but I, I, I know some things that I think will, will help anyone. It certainly can't hurt, and it's not very expensive. So uh, if anybody wants to give my contact number to any of these people and have them reach out to me, if they're willing to, you know, some people just, they don't, they, don't, uh, they don't want to talk to anybody about it. But if they're willing, I have some information that might prove valuable to them. Uh, we have uh, some shut-ins um, that need our prayers and support. Evelyn Duckworth, Carol Johnson, Ruth Ann Lemon, Kathy Simmons, Doug Stevens, Charlotte Eckert, Lonnie Kuffner, Wes McIntyre, and Bill Spears. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? We have um, uh, several events coming up uh, in the near future. Um, tomorrow night, the Monday Night Merge will be at the Lubeck Church of Christ at uh, seven, uh, 7 o'clock in the evening. And uh, the uh, theme is Sitting in Judgment based on John chapter 19 verses 1 through 16. Our youth rally will begin in just a few weeks, April 12th and the 13th. Uh, so please take a flyer from the table in the foyer and distribute it to someone you know or put them up on a bulletin board somewhere. Mark Vaughn will be asking for help, so please be thinking about the area that you can help in and be ready to uh, lend a hand. We appreciate so much all the work that everyone does for this annual event. This year, our guest speaker will be Peter Ray Cole. Uh, Mark, you know what the, is there a theme? Praise God. Praise God. All right. Um, uh, also, in the way of, uh, of events, we have um, Ladies' Night Out Thursday, March 14th at Western Sizzling at 5.30. We have uh, Friday Night Sing at Wing It Run. Um, or there's one in Freeport, uh, Friday, March 15th. Friday, March 16th, North End Youth Rally begins at 6.30. And uh, it will also uh, 
um, be on Saturday, even March 17th, uh, at 8.30 in the morning. Uh, there will be a card making uh, in the fellowship room um, here March uh, Saturday, March 16th at noon. Uh, please bring some kind of a snack uh, food if you want to come. And uh, then Sunday, March 17th, we'll have potluck after the morning worship. And Friday, March 22nd, there'll be a Friday night sing at the Dewey Avenue Church of Christ in St. Mary's at 7. So I think that does it for the announcements this morning. So uh, uh, Mr. Shears will be leading us in, in song, so let's praise God together. Number 596 will be the first song. I had a little trouble with my pitch key there a while ago. I'm trying to teach the grandson to know what he means. So he's sitting up on the front seat and he'll pick out the song for you. I heard an old, old story how a sailor came from glory and gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his rubbing of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory!
The reading this morning will be from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 through 8. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this, another beautiful Lord's Day that you bless us with. We're so thankful for the opportunity and the privilege that we have to be here this morning to worship you, the only true and living God. And we pray that the things that are said and done here today are all in accordance with your will. We pray that you would be with Elvis this morning as he delivers a portion of your word into us. And just pray that um, we will Take the words, the lesson that is presented to us, meditate upon those words and apply them to our life that we may serve you better as we go out into the world. We just pray that you would be with Elvis and Ann and uh, the great work that they do here at Sunrise and just pray that you, your blessing be upon them, that they may have many years of service to you. Heavenly Father, we would pray for uh, those who are on a sick list at this time. There are many sick, many needs. Those who are recovering from surgeries, we pray for continued recovery, uh, that they recover to their uh, natural portion of health, uh, that they may enjoy life once again. We pray for those who are facing upcoming surgeries and just pray that uh, you will guide the doctors, guide their minds, guide their hands. And we know that all healing comes with, through you. We just pray for the success of these upcoming surgeries. Uh, we pray for uh, all the others on the sick list as well various needs that they have. And we just pray for, um, for healing for all. Pray for those who um, are spiritually sick at this time and just pray that we will uh, realize our part and just that uh, we will say or do something to cause them to see the error in their way before it's too late. Pray for any who may be uh, mourning the loss of loved ones. Just pray that uh, they will find comfort in you comforting hand will be upon each and every one of them. As well, we pray for those who are traveling at this time. We pray for safe travels, uh, that they may return uh, to home once again. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this free country that we live in. We just we, uh, we know that this doesn't happen by accident. We just pray that the, uh, pray for those who fight for the freedom of this country. Pray that we will always have the freedoms that we have, especially to, to exercise the freedom of religion that we have at this very moment. Let's pray that uh, we will always have that freedom as well and not take it for granted. And the Heavenly Father, we pray that uh, you would be with us uh, throughout the rest of this life. We just pray that when this life ends, when our life ends, when this world ends, <coughs> that we will have a home in heaven with thee. With thee. As in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Song before the Lord, sorry. Oh, what wondrous love I see, relay show for you and me, by the one who did atone, just to show his matchless grace, Jesus suffered for the Yeah. 
language deep was he, we think there for you and me. For our sin to him was known, we should love him evermore for the anguish that he bore. In Gethsemane alone, oh, what love, my trust love. of our worship service set aside to remember the sacrifice that Christ made on our behalf. As I look back through the, the feasts and the ceremonies in the Old Testament, uh, they were grand and required usually a great expense to, to observe. But as the page turns, so to speak, and we, we move to the New Testament, the memorial that Christ set up is very simple. commanded his disciples to do so when they came together. And we have that opportunity still today. As we partake of the unleavened bread which represents his body that hung on Calvary's cross and the fruit of the vine that represents his blood which was shed for us. Let's give thanks for the bread. Our Father in heaven, we're so grateful for your son Jesus for the sacrifice that was made that we might all have the hope of eternal life in heaven. Father, we pray that you'll bless this bread. We pray, Father, that as we partake of it, it will be pleasing to you. And it's through Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thanks for the fruit of the vines. Father, we thank you also for this fruit of the vine that represents Christ's blood which was shed on Calvary's cross. The blood that washes away our sins. We pray, Father, that you would bless it and as we partake of it, we pray, Father, that it will be in a manner that is pleasing to you. And it's through Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. the Lord's Supper. God also commanded that we forgive of the things that we're blessed with to support the work of the church. Those baskets in the back for that purpose if we've not already done so. We're an exile. I'm pressing low the upward way, new lives I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I onward bound, Lord, let my feet on high. Oh, 
Good morning. It's good to see everyone. Certainly glad you're here today. This is the church at Jack's River, Jamaica, is small. It's probably about 20 feet deep, 10 to 15 feet wide. It's block, just plain block. There's no doors or windows. So there's windows that are open and a doorway that's just wide open. There is a roof, and that church is blessed. They have plastic chairs. That at the time I was there, I was afraid that I, I, they were so weak that I'd fall on the floor. For a matter of fact, there were similar chairs that when I went to houses to do Bible studies there, that I said one of those plastic chairs and went, Toom! of course the people laughed at me, but that's okay. But I made a mistake. I, I went there about seven or eight years on different mission trips, but the first time I was there, I made a mistake. And this is my mistake. I, I that there's they didn't have pews, they had these plastic chairs, and there's no place to put your your, your Bible or, or songbook or, or anything like that. Well, they didn't have songbooks, and they didn't have a screen or fancy stuff. Most of what they sung was just from memory. They just memorized the songs. And so they usually sung songs that, that were very you know, you, you knew the, just knew the words to them, like maybe Amazing Grace or, or something like that. But my mistake was this, I, I, I took my Bible and I, I didn't even think about this. I took my Bible and I, I sat down in a chair and I placed my Bible on the ground, on the cement concrete ground, which was dirt. I violated the code of everything. In their minds, I had sinned almost like no other sin. And they quickly, several of them quickly said, get the Bible up off the floor. And I did. And the process is, I've mentioned this before, the process is you kiss both sides of the Bible. You have to wipe it clean if it's ever dirty. You kiss both sides of the Bible, meaning you met the Bible, no harm. Now, why to us that's kind of a, 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 a weird or, or ludicrous practice because we would probably place the Bible on the floor and we have nice carpet, things like that. We probably wouldn't think anything of it. But to them, and I'm told this is like this in Africa too, throughout all the regions of Africa, the Bible is worth so much. It is their way of salvation that comes from the Bible. And in their mind, it sets high up there. There is nothing that goes higher in their mind than the Bible. And by taking God's sacred word, and we look at 2 Timothy 3, 16 and say, it's God breathed. And so it's like taking God's breath and put it in the lowest place possible, the floor, that was just, uh, you don't do that. We treat it with great respect and admiration. And, and you hold it close to your heart. And you read it and study it. Now, I will say that there were, you know, many times they were confused to some of the religious practices, to some of the different things they did there. But, but I, I, they tried to be a people that followed God's word. Their problem was they had false preachers coming in every other weekend with a different false lesson, and it got very confusing. I want to look at another town called Corinth. Maybe you're familiar with Corinth. Now, Corinth is a port city where sailors would land, and, and military would come to Corinth, and, and, and things like that, and so it was a, a, a busy metropolis, if you will. <laughs> And Corinth was a commercial military hub notorious for debauchery, drunkenness, and defilement. So a lot of stuff, if you will, went on in Corinth. 
that, that most people would say, I, I don't want any part of that. Now, now mid the merchant traders that, that would come by, and, and military tactics would go on there, and, and moral transgressors were, were, were master thinkers and, and Greek art and philosophers. In other, words, in other words, they that they would philosophize about different things also. And they spent much time doing this thing. Of course, over in Greece, they would do the very same thing and have all these statutes of all these gods. David Lipscomb said this about Corinth. He said, her cities were proud of their mental acuteness, so much so that in their conceit, they criticized all men and questioned Anything and everything. I'm not so sure it sounds any different than some of our generation today, I guess. Now, now the city's vices, as I mentioned, it's a city that a lot is going on there. They crept into the local congregation. That is why the book of 1 Corinthians is written. Because sin from the city, and it doesn't have to be sin from the world. In this case, it was sin from, that was going on in their city crept into the church. Art Linkletter said this one time when preaching to a group of 500 people. I've mentioned this before. In this group of 500, every known sin to man is present here at least once. I don't think you need 500 to, to have that. Maybe a couple hundred, you might have every known sin to man. We're probably present in that room that somebody has committed. And, and so that shouldn't surprise us. And, and, and sin is something that, that, that populates you know, quickly, if you will. For example, if I go to Las Vegas, you know, their biggest thing is, is gambling and, and, and sexual promiscuity and, and all these things. And, and so it's it would be hard for someone to go to Las Vegas and even when you go to the gas station they have slot machines there. And how tempting is it just to put your quarter or what? I just got, I got a quarter in my pocket. Put it in there. My son put it in a gumball machine by the way. But you know, put it in a slot machine. Yeah, try my luck. <coughs> oh, I almost got it. Who's got another quarter? Who's got a dollar? And that's the way they kind of get you with, with that type of thing. First Corinthians 6 and 16 said this about Corinth. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two become one flesh. And, and so in chapter 6, the, the, Paul, the author, is addressing situations with prostitution. And as you go through the book of Corinth, you see all those horrible situations that as a preacher you wouldn't really want to address in a church. What did they need in Corinth? They needed the book that I found on the floor, that I said on the floor. They needed the Bible. Corinth needed God's word more than anybody at that particular time seemed to need God's word. But if we analyze each and every place, we realize that everybody needed God's word. If we analyze our cities, our towns, our villages, our world today, we need God's word just as bad as Corinth needed God's word. See, the Bible is the only book that reveals God's mystery. The Bible is the only book that reveals God's message. In 1996, they recorded 5 billion Bibles were sold for the Guinness World Book of Records. At that particular time, there was no other book that sold more copies than the Bible. I tried to find records since 1996, and I could not. And if you look up most books sold, you know, some other books will pop up. And, and, and so I don't know if it's declined since 1996 or if it stayed the same or, or exactly what the situation is. But what we need the Word of God. 1 Corinthians 2 and verses 12 and 13. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God that we might understand the things freely given to us by God and will impart this in the world, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truth to spiritual people. You say, well, the Bible's for someone else. No, it's for someone else, and it's for the church. So I want to look 
this morning at, at, at three things. First, I want to look at man and, and kind of point out our limitations. Now, now we have our mind certainly has limitations. We we know as we get older, our body has limitations. Things that, that we, we even can't do when we could do when we were younger. But our mind has limitations. And looking at verse 9 of sec of First Corinthians chapter 2, I notice this. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined. But God is prepared for those who love him. We cannot even imagine what God has prepared for us. As a church, this is it's just amazing. Now, I will say this, that, 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 you know, God has prepared amazing, amazing things. And we can read through scripture. Some of the things, what heaven will be like. We go to the book of Revelation, and we know it's Revelation 21, verse 4, where there'll be no more tears, no more pain, no more suffering, no more death for the former things that passed away. You know, if we just look at that, you say, God, take me to a place where there's no more illness and no more pain and no more crying and no more of those horrible things. If it could just be that place, but there's more. We know from John chapter 14 that God has prepared a place for us. So we're, and, and when, you know, we'll be in God's presence. We know that from Revelation chapter 21. And, and where he will be, we will be also. Verse 3, chapter 21 of Revelation. So we know that it's a place where we'll be in God's presence. We know that there'll be nothing horrible there. But we know that also that it will just be beautiful beyond imagination. But yet, I think there's words that we cannot say or do not know or do not understand that heaven will be. No eye has seen it. No eye has seen God. No ear has heard it. We cannot understand it. If God tells us how wonderful it would be. All who hope to find the way to heaven without, or excuse me, within themselves have forgotten a biblical truth. The map to heaven is not in man's heart or in man's head. Jeremiah says this, Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 23, I know, O Lord, Jeremiah says, that the way of man is not in himself. You know, many times when we like to take things in on ourselves, say, well, I've got this under control. I can do everything about myself. I don't need anybody, any help from anybody. I don't need any wisdom from anyone. That's not true. We certainly need wisdom from God. Now, it's, it's good to have encouragement and wisdom from others around us, but we certainly need wisdom from God. I, I can learn more in 10 minutes, opening the scripture than I can from anything else. If I open to the New Testament or even the Old Testament and I read a portion of scripture and I take that portion of scripture and apply it to my life and try my best to understand it and, and I can learn more in that short time period than I can in anything else. You know, we spend time talking to each other on, on social media all day long. We spend time each other talking on the cell phones. We can't go anywhere without our cell phone for many different reasons. But we can learn more spending time with God. I mentioned before that I'd love to spend time with my uncle. There's three things that I would probably give anything for right now. To spend five minutes with my mom. To spend five minutes with my dad. Or spend five minutes with my own. Just, just give me five minutes. Five minutes would go quickly, wouldn't it? I mean, no matter who you're spending, it would go quickly. But, but the knowledge that I could get and, and the questions that I might ask, or, 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 or I don't know where I would start. Just to be with them, you know, my, my uncle and I, we would sit there in the driveway for hours and not say a word. And through that silence, we gain knowledge. And I say, well, how's that possible? That's possible. 
Isaiah would say this in Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9, for referring to God, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth. So he, so he, he gives an example here. He, here. Here's the idea. You know, God's thinking up here, we're thinking what down here. And, and they're not the same, are they? And he gives this example, the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts, my thoughts, God would say, are higher than your thoughts. No matter how hard I try, I can't think like God, but I can get a little closer by using God's word. Yet some Christians who once followed God's roadmap have neatly folded it up placed it in a glove box or somewhere else and decided to proceed in their own according to their own will. And one of those cities was Corinth. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 6 and 9. So Paul quoted Isaiah to demonstrate the, the, the fatality of, of the Corinthian thinking. Isaiah 64, verse 4. From of old no one can heed or perceived by the ear. No eye has seen God besides you who acts for those who will wait for him. Well, well secondly, not only does our mind have limitations, and we, we see that God's mystery, we mentioned the mystery, haven't we? The salvation. Now, now, many in the Old Testament didn't know what the mystery of God was. They kind of waited and waited and waited. For a matter of fact, the Jews did not know the mystery of God. It was kind of talked about here and there. Well, what's the mystery of God? Well, they don't know it's a mystery. They saw the mystery until they knew that, you know, until something happens here. And they're waiting for, you know, and they were given signs and things like that, that this Jesus was coming. Isaiah prophesied many times about Jesus. And we see in Isaiah 64, 5, you meet him who joyfully works righteousness. Now, our word there is, is, is meet. Those who remember you in, way, in your ways, behold, you were angry and we sinned. In our sins, we have been a long time. And shall we be saved? There's the question. So according to, to Mouse, the word meet, in the Hebrew, it's pega, means to strike, to touch, to intercede for or to plead with. So God pleads with us or, or, or would meet with us in that word there. He, he would strike to, he would, would, he would intercede for us. Romans chapter 11 and verse 22, we see, note the kindness and the severity of God. You know, it's like the scales, you see both of them, you see kindness and severity. Severity towards those who have not, who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness, otherwise you too will be cut off. So we see God's kindness and severity, and, and we have to understand both of the scale. And, and that's a little bit like all of us. Some of us are, 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 you know, not as patient as others. Sometimes we're very kind, but you cross over that line, we get a little angry, and it's the same type of thing with God, isn't it? And God met man in Eden before he had sinned. You go to Genesis chapter 2 and verses 5, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden. We remember that. We remember Genesis 1, 2, and 3, and 4. God took man, Adam, put him in the garden to work it. Don't miss that phrase. And to keep it. Here's some respect. Adam, I built this garden for you. Here's some responsibilities. You work the garden, you keep it. I mean, through the bushes, I guess, cut the grass, whatever you need to do. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Here's the rules. You may surely eat of every tree of the garden. All right, you're the garden man. You're keeping it, you're managing it, you're in control of the garden. You can eat anything you want in the garden, except. But, see that tree over there? tree of knowledge, good and evil, don't touch it, don't eat from it. For the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now if I'm Adam, I'm asking this one question. What is death? 
Don't miss that. We know what death is, don't we? We understand death. We've been in the funeral home. We know a physical death. Is that what Adam's, or is that what God's talking about? He's talking about two kinds of death here. He's talking about a physical death that we know about, but he's also talking about a spiritual death. In other words, Adam, you're going to be, the physical death is, is really no big deal. It's not. We think it is because that's all we understand. The spiritual death is the big deal. Because when we physically die, if we're right with God, we go to live with God. And that's, you know, that's like an upgrade. That's wonderful. But if we're spiritually dead, we don't. See, God met Adam in the garden and said, this is yours. This is what I, the plan I have for you. Of course, Adam sinned and, and God met Adam in the garden immediately after sin. When sin became a reality. Chapter 3, verse 8 and 9 of Genesis. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Watch this. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? I don't know about you, I can picture this. I want you to know that Adam and God and Eve had a wonderful relationship with God. The best relationship that you could ever imagine. If you looked down and saw Adam and Eve and God, you would say, wow, that is a relationship I want to have with somebody. And then here comes Satan. And here comes sin. And Adam is so ashamed of what he's done. He's so ashamed of the sin in his life that, that he says, I, I can't even face God. I I'm going to hide from God. I I'm going to get away from God. Maybe God won't see me. And obviously it seems like they had a habit of walking in the garden with God. Can you imagine that strolling in the evening cool to the breeze with God? And here comes God for his evening stroll, and, and Adam is, is, is hiding himself. Why? Because of sin. God had already known what had happened. But God still wanted a relationship with Adam. So God met him in the garden. Said Adam, where are you? I want you to remember that phrase, Adam. Where are you? Of course, we know what goes on next, the, the questioning and all that. Adam pops up in you know, he got to, to, takes, takes a fig leaf. How many of y'all think that would work if I took a fig leaf? No, that's not gonna work. You need a lot of fig leaves. He, he, you know, when we look at it, if Adam could have predicted God's plan, he would not have hidden from God's presence. From the corruption of the garden to the crucifixion on Golgotha, God prepared man for the solution to the problem of sin, and that is Jesus Christ. God began preparing from the very beginning the foundation of the world. John chapter 5, verse 39, you search the scripture because you think that in them you have eternal life and it is they that bear witness about me, Jesus would say. After Calvary, from the silence of the empty tomb to the surrounding of the ending of triumph, God has declared that man the solution for the problem of sin, Christ. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, that is the man, Jesus Christ. So in Christ, God meets you and I. The Christ kind of said the same, says the same thing, doesn't he? He looks at you and I and puts our name in there and says, where are you? Are you lost in a world of sin as Christ is looking for you? 
Finally, this morning, God, or God's method of revelation, God's method of revelation. Verse 10 says this, these things God has revealed. And with vision of revealing, it says that we got a cloth over something, we bring it out, uh -huh, we see it, it's been revealed to us through the Spirit. How is it revealed? Through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. So in other words, the Spirit is involved with the writing of the Bible. And the mystery has been revealed, and it can be known by all, Ephesians chapter 3 and verses 9 and 10, and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden from the ages in God who has created all things. It brings, the Bible brings it to light so that through the church, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known. Through what? The church. Don't leave the church out of God's plan. It is deeply in God's plan that the manifold wisdom of God may be made known. How did God unreveal this mystery? He used the same method that he used that he used with the prophets. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 2 and or 20 and 21. Knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever pronounced by the will of man. You can open the Bible, it does not say the will of Elvis in there. There's not your chapter with six verses, or, or that's not what it would have. But you know, a, a, a book in the Bible says by the will of Elvis in there. It's just not there. It's not my will. I'm just the messenger. I, I'm showing you God's will. It's in this book. His book through His Spirit. And this is what God would have for us. Men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit, verse 21. That which God revealed was recorded by God's chosen penmen. As the Word of God, the Bible has authority. It deserves to be heard. It deserves to be heeded. Paul said, all scripture is inspired by God. We know that 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, all scripture is breathed out by God. It's profitable for teaching, for doctrine, for correction, for training in righteousness. So every word is inspired. There's not a passage, no passages any more or less important than another. Sometimes we like to put emphasis on a certain subject or passage or something, but, but equally in the New Testament, every passage is, is, has the same weight, really, because it's all God's message, and, and if you, know, you hear God speaking, and so what would you do? You'd be quiet for, for just a minute, and you'd listen, God, what do you have to tell me? These are the words of salvation. John verse 20 and verse, John chapter 20 verses 30 and verse 31. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe. What's the purpose? That you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Well, why would I want to believe that? I believe it in that you may have life in his name. But why do we have this book with five billion copies or so? That you might believe in Jesus and go to heaven. That's why it's there. You're going to pick it up, you're going to open it, you're going to read it, and believe the things that you read because it is it's breathed out through God. It's God's revelation to us. And, and through that, then we have a chance to go to heaven. Without that, we, we have no chance. Deuteronomy 29, verse 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Biblical inspiration is, is very verbal, if you will, and God did not put ideas in a man's head, but words into their 
mountains. Many preachers will say, well, I was asleep last night and I got a dream and God told me to, to preach on this this morning. Doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. Never happened to me. And I've got a whole slew of friends that are preachers. It's never happened. They would have let me know, trust me. It, it's never happened. Well, well, how do you figure out, Elvis, how do you figure out what to preach? How do you figure out what to say? I've only got so many stories. Now, granted, some of them will tell you I got my share of stories. Some of them I will tell again and again sometimes. But if I didn't have the Bible, I would have nothing to say. I could fold up my tablet and sit down and go home. That would be it. But everything that you hear in a Bible class or you hear the sermon needs to come from the Word of God. That's what you know inspires preachers to be preachers. Because they have been moved by the Word of God. That they understand how important it is to share the Word of God to others. And you see that in the Old Testament, 2 Samuel chapter 23, the Spirit of the Lord speaks to me, Samuel would say, his word is on my tongue. Now, now these are Old Testament prophets, and, and Old Testament prophets are, are a little bit different. They were given the message directly from God because they are God's mouthpiece, and they were supposed to spill out that message, kind of vomit out that message to, to I know it's a horrible word, but that's what they were supposed to do. They were vomit out that message to the people, and the people should obey the message, should learn the message, but we know that that didn't happen all the time. They, they would send the message out. Jeremiah 1 verse 9, then the Lord put out his hand and he touched my mouth. I don't believe Samuel had a whole lot of choices whether he was going to be a prophet or not. I don't believe Jeremiah had a whole lot of choices whether he was going to be a prophet or not. I, I think they were kind of, if you will, born into it. I've known preachers for generations and generations that more or less, now I know a preacher has to make a choice to do that. And they will at some point, whether that choice is wise or good or, or whatever. But, but you have to have a little bit of, of, of that in you, if you will. That willingness to share the word of God. And Lord God said to me in Jeremiah verse one, or chapter 1, verse 9, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. We go all the way back to Genesis, and I want to close with Genesis chapter 3 this morning. We know how precious this is. You can get them for, matter of fact, we try to give these things away. There's a church down in Florida that once a month they have Bible giveaway day. They put a big sign out front. Sometimes they stand out front in the traffic light and them out the cars. Sometimes you got to come, now they have to come into the building because they really want to try to get, at least to try to get your name and information so they can contact you and try to get a Bible study with you. When you show up to, to Bible camp, that's one of the questions that I have my Bible teachers ask. Make sure that everyone has a Bible. If they don't have the Bible, you come to me and you tell me, because I've got a stack of Bibles this high. When you're right there, last year I had a stack of Bibles that high next to World Video Bible School. And, and I've got a Bible. Sometimes I'll just go and spend my own money and buy to, to always and buy six or eight of them or whatever. You know what? You need it. You know, the Bible won't gladly give you a Bible. You need this. This is the words of life. I don't want you to be unprepared. But here's the problem in Genesis chapter 3. Now, the serpent is more crafty. The serpent is the devil, by the way. He's very crafty. He is more crafty than any other beast of the field. The Lord God and man. Now the serpent said to the woman, Here's the test. Did God actually say, You shall not eat of the tree in the garden? Now, now here's our test. Put a period there for just a second, or a question mark, I should say. Here's our test. Don't read on. How would you know that today? If I ask you the same question 
How would you know? The answer should say, I can turn to the Bible and I can read it. Eve didn't have a book back then. So she had to, Eve had to rely on her memory, and her memory was probably pretty fresh, so she probably knew. But he asked the question. So the woman said to the serpent, she knew the instructions, didn't she? Here's what she says to Satan. We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the trees that are in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. Eve paid attention, didn't she? She knew exactly what God said. If she had her written copy of the Bible, she could have gone to the passage. She could have said, this is what God says. I know what he says. It's not a mystery to me. I see it written right there. I've studied it. I understand it. She didn't have that, but she had God's instructions in her mind, and she could know exactly what it was, and she quoted Satan. Now, Satan should have walked away at that point, but you know Satan is not going to walk away from our lives easy, is he? He might be trying to pull at your heart right now. You feel that pull that Satan's in your life and trying to pull and say, we'll be done in just a couple of minutes. All you have to do is outlast this couple of minutes. You know what's really going on in your life, Satan is saying, but, but, but you don't want to face up to it. You don't want to realize the sin that's really going on or, or the separation that's really going on. You just for a few more minutes. I want you to notice what Satan said to the woman. You're not going to die. You're not going to die. Now you're looking at it after the scene. And if you've been to a funeral, and probably everyone in here has been to a funeral, you know that Satan just lied. Do you think Satan's going to lie to you and going to lie to me? Absolutely. Satan just lied. You're not going to die. Don't, don't even worry about that. But then he backs it up. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open. He tries to change the subject. You know, God's kind of, he's playing with you. He's, he, when you eat of it, your eyes are going to be open. And, and you'll, be, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. He began to make her think, there's not going to be punishment for this. As a matter of fact, it would be better. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was delightful to the eyes, and it was desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. That will be enough. She gave it to her husband. He knew the same rules. Didn't even have to hear Satan say it. And her wife was enough. And she ate. And he ate. Today we suffer. That is when sin entered the world and we have to deal with what I was talking about cancer and everything else. And here's your reason. But like I said, the physical isn't where we need to worry. It's the spiritual. Spiritually, we want to have a relationship with God where we know we're going to have that we believed in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. We learned that from the Bible. We learned that from Scripture, that, that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. We have confessed that before man, and, and, and we've been baptized and, and, and repented of our sins. In other words, we, we've stopped doing those sins, stopped doing them, turned away from them. 
or righteous in the eyes of God at that point. Maybe we've not done that. It's time to do that, or maybe we've fallen away. <coughs> we've gone back to eating of the tree every day. They say, and God looks at us, Christ looks at us, and says, where are you? If you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, why don't you come? Just stand. Just stand. Just stand. Will you come? Will you come? When your poor broken heart burns and sin oppressed, lay down at the feet of your Savior and Lord. Jesus will give you rest. Oh, see everyone out. I hope to see everyone back this evening for evening worship. Uh, is there anything else that needs to be announced? Okay. If you'll bow with me, we'll have a prayer and we'll be dismissed. Our Father in Heaven, we're grateful for this day that you've given us. For this opportunity to gather together to worship your high and holy name. Father, we pray that the things said and done here this morning were pleasing to you. We pray, Father, that as we leave here, that you will be with each of us, that you'll give us safe passage to our homes. We pray, Father, that you will watch over us as we go about our lives. Help us, Father, to shine your light to those around us. We pray, Father, that you'll bring us all back together at the next appointed time. It's through Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.